Good morning. Welcome as we gather again here online as Gospel Life Church. It is good to be able to open the word and indeed to sing together today. A couple announcements as we get rolling here. I want to remind you about our newly updated website, gospellifesunrise.com. Many of you have plugged into that and been engaged with that over this past week. We've got some great resources on there on the COVID-19 page. It's resources to help you at home. Moms and dads, a great, uh, some great uh, devotionals there you can do with your children, devotionals for adults, even a playlist that has all of the songs that we sing on Sundays that can be there to encourage you during these days where we are pretty much told to stay inside. Uh, also, make sure you're paying attention to, your, to our Facebook page as well as our YouTube page. As we're putting out uh, midweek devotionals, we're putting out different things to encourage you and help you during this time. Pay attention to those. We'll be sending those links out in email, but you can also catch up to it on the Facebook page and the YouTube page as well. And let us know how we can be praying for you. We long to pray for you, and we're trying to work through to make sure we're contacting everybody and reaching out. Uh, and in that process... If there are things that come up in your life, if you have a need, if there are specific things that we can be praying with you about or ways that we can serve you, don't hesitate to reach out and let us know because it is our desire to live as the church even during these days where we're forced to be apart. We have the privilege this week of having Joseph to be able to lead us in song. And so as we prepare our hearts for that, would you join us? Don't just watch. Sing. Joseph, would you come now and lead us? Good morning, Gospel Live Church. I'm so glad that you guys are watching and using this means to encourage yourself as we worship as the church scattered. Though we're not together and this video can never replace the regular gathering of God's people, I'm thankful that during this time, we can still encourage each other through singing his word praying his word and hearing his word. In fact, hear from the words of Daniel as Nebuchadnezzar recalls who God is. Listen to these words. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. This is our God and his rule. Nothing can deter our sovereign good king so let's sing together about our great God. Sing together. Who can light the fires? Who can light the fires of a thousand burning suns? Blazing in the heavens, there is only one. He is our God. Who commands the nations? Building up and tearing down, silencing his rivals. There is only one. He is our God. See, he is our God. He is our God. Holy, you are Lord, our holy. We turned away his love, conquer us with kindness. There is only one, he is our God. Let's declare it, he is our God. He is our God. Holy, holy, you
to the King on the throne, who was and is to come, and to the Lamb who was slain be glory. Now to the King on the throne, who was and is to come, and to the Lamb who was slain be glory. Now to the King on the throne, who was and is to come, and to the Lamb who was slain be glory. Holy, holy, you alone are holy, matchless in your glory. No one is like you. of our praise. This next song is a new song that we haven't done as a congregation, but I encourage you to listen to these words and reflect on all that our God has done for us, that in our place, Jesus came and died. So hear these words. God in heaven, high and holy, Measure of all good and beauty Who can stand before the fire of holiness Sinners here so poor and needy guilty if you numbered all our sins Lord who could stand here's the chorus in my place he stood all my dead nailed to the wood all my stains washed white by the blood of Christ, my life. Justice satisfied. Justice satisfied at Calvary. Sin there silenced by his mercy. Where, O oh, death, is your reply to Christ our King? In my place he stood, all my dead nailed to the wood. All my stains washed white by the blood. Christ, my 
my life. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, thank you for your abundant mercy and love to us. Thank you that you reign supreme on your throne, that you are our hope and our joy at all times. Father, we come before you together in prayer asking you to bring an end to the outbreak of this virus. Father, would you preserve life? Would you bring healing? Would you allow in your mercy the discovery of a cure quickly? Would you protect those who are most vulnerable among us? Father, we pray that our leaders would have wisdom, that the doctors and nurses, the first responders, and even those who are working diligently to make sure we have what we need, Lord, would you give them all strength and wisdom and endurance in these days? Father, we ask you for your grace. Lord, give us the grace to see the frailty of our own strength and the the majesty of your awesome glory. Lord, give us the joy that is only found in you. Fill us with the peace that is only found in what you give. And may we rest in your protection and your rescue. Be with us now as we open your word together. Be exalted as we look to you in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As children, playing around the world, the games vary some. They've got different games that are popular at different continents and different countries and different regions of the world. Games that uh, many of us would be familiar with in their more adult versions But at the same time, there's one game that you can find nearly everywhere in the world. Tag, you're it. The game of tag is played by children around the world because the basics of it are pretty much I'm going to run and you're going to chase and that's how it works. In the more advanced games of tag, sometimes you have to be frozen. In many scenarios of tag, there's a base. I remember when I was growing up playing tag, it was always a mad dash to get to safety at base. Today we're going to meditate on Psalm 91. Psalm 91, there's not much known about the background of this psalm, who wrote it, exactly when it was composed. What's described here is the very threats and sufferings that are commonly experienced in life. This psalm seems to have different voices dialoguing back and forth, culminating with the voice of God himself, promising his peace, his rescue, and the eternal hope that we have in him. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up to Psalm 91 and follow along as I read aloud for us here at this time. Hear the words of the Lord. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. 
You will not fear the arrow, the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. The main point that I want us to see here in this passage this morning is that the Lord is your refuge. The Lord is your refuge. Look first at the amazing promise of God's protection. As we read through this psalm, we cannot help but be amazed with the astounding promises of God's protection. Opening by addressing God as most high, the almighty, descriptions of God as being above and over all. The psalmist points us to see the magnificence of God's eternal power. It's incomparable. There's none who can compare to the almighty God whom we serve. And then coupled with this grand perspective, the goodness of being near to God. If you're going to be in the shadow of a tree, you have to be near the trunk. If you're going to be in the shadow of God, it's the nearness to Him where we find this refuge and this hope. When our trust is fully in God, we are given rest even when the battle rages around. As the psalmist identifies that God is our refuge and our fortress. God is our only safe place. The fortress is a place of sure defense. The refuge is a place of rest. In God, we find both. Weaving together a variety of things that might possibly come against us in this life, the psalmist displays God to be our protection and our rescue. We don't need to fear those things which threaten your life, for God is your protection. Look at verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 again. He will cover you with his pinions. Sorry, back in verse 3. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. God protects against intentional acts of evil, That would be wrought against you, the fowler's snare, the arrow that flies at noonday. God protects against natural evil, earthquakes, great storms, famines, disease, the deadly pestilence described here in the passage. God's protection is not governed by day or night. It is not as though the things that happen at night are outside of his vision or control. It's not as though the things that happen in the day he is unable to guard against. Rather, he is faithful to protect at all times. God is also the rescue of his people amid peril. Look at verses 7 through 10. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. Finding your refuge in the Lord, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. Amid thousands falling, 
to the devastations of evil, you will find your refuge in God, who is your rescue. Verses 11 through 13 point us to see God's work through his angels on behalf of his people, protecting us from dangers both great and small. Verses 11 through 13, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion, the serpent you will trample underfoot. Some take these verses to say that every person has a guardian angel. That's a far stretch to to mine out of this passage. But what we recognize is that God directs his angels, plural, to the protection and guarding of his people. So at a certain time, given a certain set of scenarios, it may be an entire garrison of heavenly angels that come to the aid in your situation. Their work is to protect you from dangers both great and small. Striking your foot against a stone or the lion and the serpent. The closing verses bring in the direct voice of God. Promising his great rescue and protection and salvation. Look at verses 14 through 16 again. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. God works mightily for the protection of his people. We can see this ab- this abundance throughout the scripture as in even the history of the church, God's protection on behalf of his people. Think about Noah. Noah and his family were protected from the flood by the hand of God. Abraham, countless times he and his family were protected and guarded and delivered throughout his wandering, finding his place in the promised land. Moses was rescued as a baby in in a famous story in the scripture of how he was put in the basket and and sent out into the Nile and then recovered and rescued by the hand of God. And then God went on to work through Moses to rescue his entire people out of bondage in Egypt to bring them to the promised land. Even in their rebellion in the desert, you see God's protection and care, his rescue by providing them for them as they wandered, providing what they needed to eat and drink in the middle of the desert. King David fought a giant, and the hand of the Lord was with him and brought deliverance. And then protected King David over and over again against the wrath of Saul. In the New Testament, we see God miraculously rescuing Peter from prison. Restoring Paul to life after having been stoned to death outside of Lystra. At the end of his second letter to Timothy, Paul writes, and he says how he was spared from the lion's mouth because the Lord stood by him at his defense. Countless times throughout church history as well, we see God's faithful protection and rescue of his people. When you read stories of modern missions, this just kind of leaps off the page. They're dripping with the protection and rescue of God. I love the story, God's Smuggler recounting the story of Brother Andrew, who would smuggle Bibles into the former Soviet Union. At one point in the story, it tells how they were pulled over on the side of the road and made a cup of coffee, and their car was loaded down with Bibles to distribute, illegal Bibles there in the Soviet Union. They were pulled up in a kind of a line of cars, and two officers walked up immediately, startling them. The officers didn't say a word. They looked at them glaringly for a few moments and then went to the family that was parked in front of them and made them unpack every element of their car. Brother Andrew and his friend who was with him were sitting there wondering what to do. After about 30 minutes, the police officers still had not looked to them, still had not said anything to them. They calmly packed up their stuff, loaded their car, 
pulled out slowly and drove away. The Lord brought protection and rescue in that day. Adoniram Judson, early missionary to Burma, was at one point imprisoned for two years in a death prison. He was accused of being a British spy during the time which Brit, uh, Great Britain was at war with the Burmese people. Through the faithful pleading of his wife Anne, God delivered him after two years in that torturous death camp. You see, even in our own lives, you can see God's faithful care, His protection and rescue over and over again in your story. Sometimes, these are in big, massive, unmistakable ways. We're pleading with God for an answer and He comes through mightily displaying His glory and His protection and His rescue. But so often it is in the countless smaller ways of which we're not even fully aware. Which one day, perhaps in glory, we will see. But in this moment, we are completely unaware of. It's like a mother caring for her infant child. In countless ways, the child's life is protected and, and rescued and provided for by that mother. Yet the infant has no understanding, no idea of how much the mother is providing. As the child grows, they begin to get a little glimpse, a little glimmer of how much that mother is caring for them, protecting them, keeping them safe, guarding them. But even in those moments, they don't see fully all that's taking place. Christian, your God has promised you his amazing protection. You can take confidence that when you call to him, he will answer. In your day of trouble, he will be with you. Your God will show you his great salvation. Now I realize many of you at this point are thinking or perhaps wondering, well, Pastor Mark, that sounds great, but that's not really all my experience. There are glimmers of that, there are experiences of that, but then there are other times where I, I really don't see the answers. These promises seem far too grand to be true. You know, we, we read here in verse 10, No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. And if you're like me, I think, well, wait a minute, I, I, I haven't seen the news headline come out yet that Christians are immune from the coronavirus. How can this be true? I look at my, my own life, and I see experiences of sickness and evil, and my guess is that most of you would have that as part of your story too. To be honest, when we scan across church history, even the history of the Bible... There are far more examples of Christian suffering than we would care to mention. Adoniram Judson, yeah, he was delivered after two years in a death prison, but during those two years, his experience is gut-wrenching as he lay exposed, chained to others who were dying next to him with little to no rations, mostly sick the entire time. In 1956... A team of five families went to Central America to reach a tribal peoples with the gospel. Shortly after contacting this people for the first time, all five of those men were speared to death by the people they were trying to reach with the gospel. Throughout the ages of the church, there have been countless thousands of Christian martyrs killed simply for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, yeah, he was spared from the lion's mouth as he wrote to Timothy. But several years later, he was beheaded. Peter was freed from prison that night in that beautiful story. But yet he would be crucified upside down. In the Old Testament, we see the record of the people of Israel time and time again. God not protecting them, but rather handing them over to the nations. 
We have an entire book entitled Lamentations, written by the prophet Jeremiah as he sat and watched Jerusalem burn to the ground. So is this psalm wrong somehow? Is God's protection of his people not as foolproof and solid as it may at first glance be? You see, there's a danger in our day to which many have sadly fallen to believe that this psalm, Psalm 91, is conditioned upon how well we dwell and abide from verse 1 and how well in verse 14 we hold fast to God in love. To boil it down to you and your performance. God's protection, God's rescue of you comes down to how well you're abiding and how well you're dwelling in him and how well you're holding fast to him in love. If you simply just have enough faith, if you simply just abide deep enough, then you won't get sick and you won't be harmed and you'll be protected from all the evils of this life. And this sounds fair at the first glance, but it's based upon our natural inclination towards a merit-based system. But yet if we read the story of the scripture, God is not operating on a merit-based system. God is not operating based upon your track record. He's operating on the basis of mercy and grace and love. It's also wrong to presume that simply having more godliness, faith and obedience in God, that will necessarily receive the physical rewards of this psalm. That's a wrong presumption, and we know that because that was the deception that the devil threw in the face of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. You see, some of you recognize some of the verses here because it's exactly quoted by the devil himself in the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, the devil is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. We see that he throws three temptations. This is the second of those temptations. And we see here in verses 5 and 6 this record. The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. That's Psalm 91. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. That's the next verse in Psalm 91. Jesus' rejection of the devil's temptation shows us that there is a danger to causing a one-to-one -one correlation between great godliness equals these protections. If the godliness, godliest person, the Lord Jesus Christ, rejected this temptation and rather chose a path of suffering, it cannot mean that simply having more godliness equals less suffering. So what are we to do with Psalm 91? What are we to do with what is written here is the word of God to us? Is the psalmist merely naive, foolish, downright deceptive? The promises of this psalm do come true for the saints of God. Because God is the fortress and refuge of his people. God does deliver and rescue and protect and heal his people. But the writer of the psalm is not ignorant of the suffering of God's people. Surely he would have been familiar with many of the other psalms that we have record of. For instance, Psalm 44, verse 22. Yet for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The psalm that was fulfilled in Jesus, Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. See, Jesus himself says in Luke 21, these two things side by side together. In Luke 21, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he says this in verses 16 through 18. 
you will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair on your head will perish. How did these two things come together? Again, the writer of Hebrews, when he's recording the stories of the faithful, the testimony of those who trusted God in the hardest of times, he writes of the prophets in verse 33 and 34, those who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Yet in verse 36 and 37, speaking of the same group, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, and they were sawn in two, and they were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. You see, the dilemma of Psalm 91 runs thick through the Scripture. How do we reconcile the reality of our human experience of suffering and the amazing promises of God in Psalm 91? I think there are two main conclusions for us to observe here. Two main conclusions from the beauty of Psalm 91 open before us. The first is that God does regularly deliver his people from the sufferings of this life. God does deliver his people from the sufferings of this life. As we have already seen, the people of God over and over again testify to God's deliverance and protection from temporal evils in this life. Sometimes it's clear and obvious. Fervently praying that God would hear us fervently praying that God would answer in a certain way, and he does. And we give praise to him and glory for his deliverance and his protection. Yet other times, his deliverance and protection comes in ways of which we're completely unaware. Perhaps only in eternity will we see clearly how much our God has done for us. The second thing we need to recognize, and the harder side of this, is that God does allow suffering and evil in your life, but only so much as His love demands. God does allow suffering and evil in your life, but only so much as His love demands. Hear me carefully in this. No evil can befall you ultimately. No evil, no suffering can touch you except what his love demands for your eternal and everlasting good. When you go to a physician, after diagnosing what the problem is, why you're feeling rough, they recommend a treatment. Perhaps it's a shot. Nobody likes needles. Perhaps it's a procedure, a surgery. They know that with the infliction of a small pain, it will result in far greater healing down the road. An athlete training knows the soreness that comes through days at the gym, through long runs and exercise and practice. They know the pain and the injuries that come through over and over subjecting your body to training. But the goal of the temporal pain is the lasting victory on the field. God, in his infinite and perfect wisdom, is at work for your ultimate and everlasting good. He knows precisely the right balance in your life of suffering and deliverance that will fashion for you the greatest joy in eternity. With him. Our greatest example of this truth is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Hear how Paul writes about it to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2. Speaking of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, 
we hear this declaration of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Through the suffering comes the glory. Again, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 Turning our eyes to see Jesus says this in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. With joy, he endured the cross. Why? Because he knew the ends of it. This is the foundation of the gospel. You and me, made in the image of God, living in God's world which he made perfect, yet like our first parents, we have willingly rebelled against our maker, seeking to live life our own way, live according to our own rules, taking the crown that rightly belongs to him and trying to shove it onto our own heads. But in doing so, we realize the frailty of our rule. Because everything we touch, even our own lives, ends up breaking before us. And not only that, we stand rightly under the judgment of our maker, of the rightful king. Yet God in his love did not leave you there. Did not leave you subject to the judgment of your sin. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came... Not in glory and pomp and, and to be served with a silver spoon, but came to live and walk among us. He became fully man as fully God. Took on our humanity and lived perfectly under God's rule. Yet God put your sin on Jesus God put your sin on Jesus that he would suffer and die in your place. And through that suffering, you receive eternal joy. And the call to every one of us is to look upon this, the greatest evil the world has ever known, the most unjust suffering ever perpetrated, and see the glory of God at work in turning what was meant for evil to be eternally good for you, for me. Friend, amid the upheaval and anxieties of our world, Today, all the uncertainties in the things that used to be considered certain, your only firm hope is in Jesus. Turn from trying to be your own king. Repent of living a life of rebellion against God. Confess your sins and trust him as the eternal king. Serve him, follow him, obey him. Trust that what he has done is enough for you. Christian, your confidence in the face of suffering and evil is rooted in this awesome reality. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 8. These words, familiar at the beginning, 
He says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are the called according to His purpose. For we know that those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. God is weaving all things together for your good and ultimate everlasting joy. He continues, what shall we say to these things? These things are the sufferings we experience in life, the hardships, the burdens we carry. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? For who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who in, is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Shall distress? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, writes the apostle, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What Paul means here when he says more than conquerors is not simply that we overcome, but rather those things which are designed by the enemy, the suffering, the evil of this life, which is designed to break you down. God is working in and through it to turn it for your everlasting good and joy. Even the worst evil you could imagine in your life. God in His divine purposes is bringing it all the way around for your joy. Charles Spurgeon in his meditation on Psalm 91 wrote this, It is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. Ill to him is not ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. Death is his gain. No evil in the strict sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. Happy is he who is in such a case. He is secure where others are in peril. He lives where others die. Spurgeon grasped the heart of what it means to be under the protection of God. It's what the Apostle Paul said to the Philippians when he writes in chapter 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Here too is the encouragement that he gives the Thessalonian church. At the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says this, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, that's metaphors for alive or dead, we might live with Him. Therefore, the encouragement of the Apostle Paul says, encourage one another and build one another up. Christian, in the face of evil and suffering, you are assured of God's ultimate and everlasting victory. 
the anxieties surrounding this virus, which swirl throughout our community every day at this point. God's purposes and plans are not thwarted by this virus. Christian, your sufferings are never the result of uncontrolled chaos but rather your good and eternal God is working all things for your good and eternal joy in Him. Christian, rest in the protection and deliverance of your God. No evil or suffering can befall you except what His love demands for your ultimate and everlasting good and joy. I love how John Piper writes of this in reflecting on this psalm. He says this, Your executioner may laugh you to scorn for quoting Psalm 91, but in the end, you will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. You know, as children, we played tag And we would race to get to safety on base. But Christian, base has run to you. Christian, the Lord, your refuge has come to you. He is your rescue. He is your protection. Amid all the sufferings and evils of this life, the Lord is your refuge. God will and does bring deliverance in this life. Pray to him. Call out to him. Know that he will hear you and he will answer. But know also that he does allow suffering into your life, but only so much as his love requires to fashion you for eternity with him. Friend, in these uncertain days, they will leave you racked with anxiety and fear because everything we thought was firm and stable is now fractured. Our source of certainty in this life is broken. Yet your only source of certainty and hope has only and will always be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from trusting yourself. Repent before God of trying to live life your own way and trust in what Jesus has done to bring rescue to you, to free you from the penalty and bondage of your sins and to give you hope and life eternal with him. Christian, rest in God's perfect love for you. Worship him for his divine protection and rescue, knowing that nothing can take you from his love. Father, it is in you that we find all our hope all our strength, all our security. Father, it is in you alone that we can turn to whom we can turn as our rescue and our fortress, our refuge amidst the sufferings and evils of life. Lord, would you Implant your word deep into our lives that we would rest in you alone. Be magnified as we trust you, as we call out to you, knowing that you are good and faithful and at work in all things for your glory and our everlasting joy. In the mighty name of Jesus, our King, we pray. Amen.
We believe that God's Word, by God's Spirit, impacts our thinking and our will and our affections. I would encourage you to respond to the Word today. Perhaps you need to talk with somebody there at your house. I would encourage you to read this together aloud. Meditate on it together. Talk about it. Think about it. If you're there all by yourself, I would encourage you to call somebody up. Share with them this psalm and the things that the Lord has laid upon your mind from it. I'd love to hear from you myself. Feel free to reach out to me. If you've got my phone number, reach out that way. If not, send an email to office at gospellifesunrise.com. You can also reach out via Facebook. Uh, we would love to hear from you how the Lord is working your heart through this time so that we could also know how to pray for you and pray with you. Take some time today and meditate on Psalm 91 and let the Lord burn these truths deep within us that our hope would be in him. At this time, Joseph is going to lead us again in a song. Would you sing with us and rest in the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's respond to what we've just heard. Jesus is our only refuge. He's the only source of life. He's the one that we cling to because he claims us with his love. Let's sing together. Jesus, your mercy is all my plea. I have no defense. My guilt runs too deep. The best of my works pierce your hands and your feet. Jesus, your mercy is all my plea. Jesus, your mercy is all my boast. The goodness I claim, the grounds of my hope. Whatever I lack is still what I need most. Jesus, your mercy is all my Praise the King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. He is all our rest. Jesus, your mercy is all my rest. The fears weigh me down and enemies press. A comfort I cling to in life and in death. Jesus, your mercy is all my rest. Praise the King who bore my sin took my place when I stood content. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. all our joy. Jesus, your mercy is all my joy. Forever I'll lift my heart and my voice to sing of a treasure no power can destroy. Jesus, your mercy is all my joy. Praise the King. Took 
to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Grace and peace to you all.